Chapter 25 Review There were a large number of structures found within the nephron that you should familiarize yourself with, as well as a number of different hormones, which are always important. And you should especially understand the link between the production of urine and blood pressure. This is a tightly regulated process. In fact, it was regulated on multiple levels. We regulated GFR, we regulated reabsorption, and to a certain extent, secretion. Kidney function occurs within units called nephrons. We start with the glomerulus, which is a ball of fenestrated capillaries. The holes in these capillaries allow liquids and small solutes to penetrate and be collected by the Bowman's capsule. Podocytes can assist in what gets filtered and what remains in the bloodstream. The filtrate will travel to the proximal convoluted tubule next, where about 70% of the electrolytes and nutrients will be reabsorbed. Next, the filtrate will travel to the loop of Henle. As filtrate travels deeper in the kidney, it encounters regions of higher solute concentration. Aquaporins in the descending limb allow water to be reabsorbed down its concentration gradient. This will concentrate the filtrate. This now concentrated filtrate will be pushed upwards, and as it returns to the more cortical regions of the kidney, it encounters regions of lower solute concentration. Ion channels will allow for the passive reabsorption of electrolytes in the ascending limb. Blood vessels, called the vasa recta, travel in the opposite direction, collecting the electrolytes from the ascending limb and the water from the descending limb. This blood flows in the opposite direction of filtrate, and we call this countercurrent exchange. Next, the filtrate will reach the distal convoluted tubule, where aldosterone can regulate the reabsorption of sodium. Lastly, the filtrate reaches the collecting ducts. The collecting ducts will travel deeper once again down into the kidney. ADH can regulate the expression of aquaporins in the collecting duct, and if aquaporins are present, then water will be reabsorbed down its concentration gradient, and concentrated urine will be produced. If ADH is absent, dilute urine will be produced because the water is not reabsorbed and stays in the filtrate to become urine. We make the distinction between filtrate and urine because once the fluid leaves the collecting duct and enters a minor calyx, that fluid will not change until it is excreted from the body. If a red blood cell were to travel up the afferent arterial, it would be too large to fit between the fenestrae of the capillaries and the filtration slits of the podocytes. Therefore, it would exit the glomerulus via the efferent arterial, which next becomes a paratubular capillary. These travel around the convoluted tubules until they join back up with a cortical radiate vein, which will begin the journey back out of the kidney. In a patient with diabetes, Excessive blood glucose could lead to large enough levels of glucose in the filtrate that it would exceed the transport maximum. Therefore, some glucose could wind up traveling to the loop of Henle and beyond, where it acts as an osmotic diuretic, increasing urine production. Next up, a molecule of urea, upon entering the glomerulus, would be small enough to be filtered and wind up in the Bowman's capsule. It would next travel to the proximal convoluted tubule, through the loop of Henle, to the distal convoluted tubule, into the collecting duct, and finally exit into a minor calyx. Urea is one of our three major nitrogenous wastes that winds up in urine because it is small enough to be filtered, but it is not reabsorbed. Any other small molecules that the kidney does not recognize will face a similar fate, being removed from the bloodstream and winding up in urine. By this mechanism, the kidneys can help keep the blood clean without recognizing what it is that might be bad for our health. We only need to recognize what is good for our health 
things like sodium and glucose and amino acids. Any chemical that can block the reabsorption of sodium in a nephron will tend to act as a diuretic. That's because water will follow sodium passively via osmosis. So if we indirectly block water reabsorption, there will be less water in the bloodstream, which means lower blood volume, which means lower blood pressure. Not everything that's a diuretic will lead to a drop in blood pressure, however. For instance, if I drink a lot of water, that should increase urine production, but lead to no change in my blood pressure. We need to target molecules that are not under a homeostatic control mechanism, such as the sodium transporters found more proximally in the nephron, and not the ones that are found more distal. The juxtaglomerular apparatus, or JGA, is a part of every nephron. It can restrict blood flow into the glomerulus, reducing filtrate production, which should help to maintain blood pressure. It can also produce the hormone renin, which will increase blood pressure. The two major parts of the JGA are the JG cells found on the afferent arterial and the macula densa, which is part of the distal convoluted tubule. This part of the tubule comes close to the Bowman's capsule, although keep in mind it is still distal, meaning further down the tube. If the JG cells detect a drop in blood pressure, or the macula densa a drop in sodium, this will trigger constriction of the afferent arterial and the release of renin. Sympathetic stimulation will also do these two things, which should lead to an increase in blood pressure. The effects of renin are indirect. It activates the hormone angiotensin 1, which activates the hormone angiotensin 2. The effects of angiotensin 2 are widespread. It causes systemic constriction of blood vessels, which leads to an increase in blood pressure. It also increases thirst, aldosterone, and ADH secretion, which also increase blood pressure. There is a third type of cell, the mesangial cells, that are part of the JGA, but because little is known about them, I do not put them on my exams. At rest, the bladder is under sympathetic tone, which will constrict the internal urethral sphincter and lead to relaxation of the detrusor muscle. This will allow the bladder to fill up with urine. When it reaches about one liter's worth of urine, this will trigger stretch receptors in the bladder, which will send this signal to the spinal cord and activate parasympathetic nerve fibers. These connect to the bladder in a reflex arc, dumping acetylcholine, which causes the detrusor muscle to constrict and the internal urethral sphincter to relax. Because the external urethral sphincter is still constricted, we are not urinating at this time. This squeezing greatly increases the pressure which we can detect up in the brain as the need to pee. It's not until we consciously relax the external urethral sphincter that urination should begin.